so we had thermochemistry last semester in chapter 5 um, of your book where we learned about uh, thermodynamics and first law of thermodynamics. So just a recall uh, from chapter 5 that we know the energy of the universe is constant, right? Energy cannot be destroyed or uh, created. That's what the first law of thermodynamics is. And therefore, the total energy of the universe is a constant. And um, energy can be converted from one form to another or transferred from a system to the surroundings and vice versa. Remember those words? System, surroundings and when energy is getting transferred to surroundings what is the sign of q when surroundings to system what is the sign of q what does those things mean remember all those things okay if you don't chapter five have a nice bedtime reading today okay just um, refresh your uh, uh, skills on chapter five i mean not everything but just as those words and what do those things means just the basics revise them one more time um, now here this is a continuation of um, what we learned in chapter 5 um, we learned in chapter 5 mainly we focused on entropy and entropy changes and we had briefly talked about something else called and sorry we learned enthalpy and enthalpy changes in chapter 5 and briefly we got introduced to entropy right which is usually called as randomness of a system. So here in this chapter, we are going to pick up on entropy and um, go develop a little more uh, into that. But before that, again, we need to understand a couple of uh, new words or what is the meaning of these common words we will see later. The first one is spontaneous process. What do we mean by a spontaneous process? So, as the word suggests, spontaneous process are those that can proceed without any outside intervention. Here is an example. The first picture shows two um, chambers. Chamber A is empty, but chamber B is filled with a gas and uh, they are connected through that narrow tube and there is a piston right there which you can open or close. Right now the piston is closed, that is why chamber A is empty, chamber B is filled with the gas. If you open that without any other intervention, the gas from chamber B is going to diffuse into chamber A, right? And they will keep moving until the pressure on both chambers are exactly the same. So that process or that uh, steps, those are called spontaneous process. It just happens. You don't have to do anything to the gas. You just open the, um, open the valve and the gas is just going to um, spontaneously diffuse into vessel A. But <clears throat> once the gas is in both vessels, let's say you go and again put the uh, piston or put that um, lock into the closed position. Is the gas automatically go back to chamber B? It wouldn't, right? Or in other words, the reverse process is not a spontaneous process. As, as you know, if you want to put the gas again back to chamber B, you have to do something else, not just closing that lock, right? So, spontaneous process is something which occurs without any intervention, whereas non-spontaneous process does not happen naturally or without any intervention. For non-spontaneous process, you may have to do some work. Um, here is another example, um, a spontaneous process. If you leave a nail, a shiny nail outside in the cold weather, wet weather, you know that the nail will get rusted, right? It will react with air, oxygen, and a coating of iron oxide will form, and that is what is called the nail is rusting. Now, if you, let's say, 
you left the nail out for a week in a rainy week now if you leave the rusted nail outside for a nice sunshiny week would the nail automatically become shiny again no or in other words the rusting that process was spontaneous it happened you didn't do anything it was just left outside but the reverse process is not going to happen right if you want the nail rather shiny back again you may have to pick up that nail and sand it down you know remove all the rust you have to do something it wouldn't happen spontaneously right so that is another example uh, the reverse process is not spontaneous now there are some processes which are spontaneous at one temperature may be not spontaneous at another temperature so here is an example the first beaker you have ice in there and if you keep the temperature above 0 degree celsius if you keep that beaker the Erlenmeyer flask at a temperature which is above 0 degree celsius ice would melt right you don't have to do anything it's a spontaneous process but if you take the same beaker after the ice is um, melted if you take the same beaker and keep it just below 0 degree celsius without you doing anything the water will start freezing again and it will become ice or in other words this is one example where the spontaneous the one direction is spontaneous in a particular temperature and if you change the temperature the reverse process is become spontaneous but the iron example it wouldn't work right as i just said if it is a cold wet weather iron rust but just by changing the wetness or the temperature of the weather iron is not going to go back to its shiny state so this is not true for all process that is why it says some process um, which are spontaneous at one temperature may be not spontaneous at another temperature so as i just said above zero degree ice would melt that is the spontaneous process whereas below zero degree the reverse process or freezing of water is spontaneous so here again the picture of our system and surroundings now let's say our system and surroundings have the same are kept at the same temperature t if you add an amount of heat which is designated as delta t to the system the heat is slowly going to dissipate it away to the surroundings right or heat flow is from system to the surroundings that is the spontaneous process now if you look into the second picture if you are taking exactly the same amount you added previously that is you added delta t in the first step now you are going to take away delta t away from the system now what happens the heat from the surroundings is going to move into the system right now what does it say in a reversible process or when you call a process which is reversible as the word suggests just by doing the opposite you can reverse the direction also so by adding heat the direction was heat transferring from system to surroundings just by removing the same amount of heat you can reverse the direction now the heat flow is from surroundings to system these type of processes are called reversible processes or as it says a reversible process is a process like in the such a way that the system and surroundings can be restored to the original states by exactly reversing the process you add heat the reverse process is remove heat you just do that and you can keep changing the direction of the process now let's consider another picture so here again we have a chamber we have gas filled in one side the other side it's vacuum or empty 
and it has a partition which is movable and we have a piston at the opening. You just lift the partition. Of course, we know that the gas is going to diffuse into the other part also or it will get filled or it will occupy the entire space, right? So that is a spontaneous process. So the work you did was lifting this partition. Now, just by putting the partition down, which is the reverse process, can you reverse the change also? You cannot. See the, can you see the comparison? In the previous example, you added delta t and you just took away delta t, right? Just by doing the same process but in two different directions, you change the direction of the process also. Whereas here, you lifted the partition, gas will move or fill the entire chamber, just by putting it down, the reverse process, you are not going to push the gas to one side again, right? To push the gas to one side, actually you have to do some work. You have a piston, so if you do some work, of course you can push the gas away again to one side. So this type of processes are called reversible process. That is expanding of this gas into the entire chamber. That is an irreversible process. Just by putting the partition down, you cannot reverse uh, or you cannot undo that process. So irreversible processes cannot be undone by exactly reversing the change to the system. So the, all spontaneous processes we see are irreversible. That's where we are coming to. So first we started with spontaneous process. So if you again think about spontaneous process, it is something which happens without any outside intervention, right? So outside intervention means some form of work. So if you don't have to do any work, it would happen just as it is in the system, then that is a spontaneous process. And spontaneous processes are irreversible, just like here. You lifted the partition, the gas would diffuse, that was a spontaneous process and that cannot be reversed just by putting the partition down. So spontaneous processes are irreversible. Now we can look into entropy once we understand what is spontaneous process and non-spontaneous process or what is reversible and irreversible process. So entropy as we know can be thought of as a measure of the randomness of a system and how does this randomness arise in a system? It relate, relates to the extent to which energy is distributed or, distributed or dispersed among various motions of the molecules in the system. So when we say randomness, how do we decide a system is random or how random it is? What is the extent of randomness? It actually originates from the molecular motions. Now there are various, oh, before we go to the molecular motions, another thing about entropy is just like internal energy E and enthalpy H which we have seen in chapter 5, entropy is also a state function. What do we mean by a state function? Sorry. It depends only on the initial and final state of the system. It doesn't depend upon the path the system achieved that state. Okay? Um, just like ice and water. Initial state was water, final state is ice. It depends only on those two states. It doesn't matter you left it outside and it slowly cooled down to ice or you left it in the refrigerator and you quickly cooled it down to ice or you did something else. I don't know which other way you can freeze water to ice. So it doesn't matter which method or which path you choose, but it depends only on the states, that is the initial state and final state of the system. Those properties are, uh, those are called state functions. 
So, having said that, change in entropy. So, if entropy is a state function, then when we say change in entropy, it depends solely upon entropy of the final state and entropy of the initial state. It does not matter which way uh, from the initial to final the system reached initial to final. It just depends upon the states. So, so first law of thermodynamics as we learned in chapter 5 that uh, was about conservation of energy. Now, the second law of thermodynamics is about entropy or the second law generally says that entropy of the universe increases for spontaneous or in other words reversible processes and entropy of the universe does not change for reversible or non-spontaneous processes. Okay? So, this is the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy, uh, I am breathing and talking guys through my mouth. <laughs> what? Really? It does not feel so cool. So, entropy of the universe increases for spontaneous processes and we said already all spontaneous processes are irreversible or in other words if we put it in other words for a reversible process so these notations delta s of universe means entropy of the universe and what do we mean by the universe in thermodynamics universe consists only two items system and surroundings, right? That is all. That is what the universe means. So, for a reversible process, when you take the change in entropy of the system and change in entropy of the surroundings and if you add them together, that is what the change in entropy of the universe, it will be exactly 0. What does that mean? Can you expand that little more? just the first line. What do you think about in terms of sign of the change in entropy in each of them? Exactly opposite of the change in surroundings. Exactly. That is the only way when you add both of them, you get 0, right? So, that is what is true for a reversible process. Whereas, an irreversible process, we said the second law says that for every reversible process, delta S of the universe increase, right? So, delta S of the universe increase means when you add these two quantities, you should get a value which is greater than 0 or um, that quantity should be positive. That is what the second law of thermodynamics says. So, again this means that as a result of all spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe increase or the net entropy change of the universe in a spontaneous process will be a positive quantity. So, now let us look into entropy on the molecular scale um, and Boltzmann, Ludwig Boltzmann is the scientist who described the concept of entropy at the molecular level. Now, this is the gravestone of um, Boltzmann and on the gravestone that equation is already encrypted. Now, there is something slightly wrong with that equation because as you see when we later when we look at the equation, um, it is k natural log w, l and w. But at that time, during his time, the natural logarithm was known as log log. Later we developed the base 10 and we changed the names for natural logarithm as ln and base 10 as log. So, that is why at that time that was true. Um, so, let us see what he did. Anyway, remember this, we know this, when, a, when we heat a substance, 
we know that the molecules of the motion increase, right? Thereby, the kinetic energy also increase. We know that already. So, that is where we start. Um, how do we develop the entropy on the molecular scale? Now, as I said, there are uh, different types of motion in a molecule, uh, mainly three types. The first type of motion is called translational and translational means movement of the entire molecule from one place to another. Of course, if you heat like water which is kept cold and water which is warm, the molecules are in motion in the warm water, right? Or in the cold water probably the molecules have very less, they possess very less kinetic energy, so they really do not want to move. They feel like what I am feeling right now, just do not want to move from one point to another because they have no energy at all. Whereas in warm water when molecules possess more kinetic energy, they move around from one place to another, right? So that type of motion is called translational motion. The second type of motion is vibrational motion, which is the periodic motion of atoms within a molecule. Here is the picture of different types of vibrations a molecule can undergo. One, this is, let us assume this is a water molecule. One type of vibration is, let us say, both hydrogen atoms. They are kind of stretching and coming together, coming closer to the oxygen. So, this type of vibration. The other type of vibration is, you can look at the, see the position. This was here before and now it is here. Or in other words, the molecules are kind of coming closer to themselves and moving away from each other. The other one is, one is moving closer to the uh, central atom while the other is moving away from the central atom, okay? Uh, so these are three different uh, modes of vibration. And the third type of motion in a molecule is rotational motion. Well, rotational uh, or rotation of the molecule on about an axis or rotation about sigma bonds. You can think of this as, um, what do you call it? What do you call it, guys? The stuff you just put on to the ground and it keeps rotating on the axis. What do you call it? The top, yes. I know sometimes how you forget the simple words. So, it's you can think of this as the, the tops. How does that move? Just on an axis, it keeps rotating, right? So, just like that, molecules can, let's imagine, like, see, if you have an axis right here, this molecule can keep rotating in that way also. So, that is rotation. So, these are the three major types of motions. Now, what Boltzmann did is, he just envisioned the motions of a sample of molecules at a particular instant of time. So, if you take a sample of a particular molecule, sample of anything, let us say sodium chloride, different molecules are doing different motions at the same time, right? It is not that everyone says, okay, let us do the translational. Once it is all done, let us do vibrations, then let us do rotations. It is not like that. Different molecules are doing different rotations and they have different speeds, right? There are a lot of things going on. So, he envisioned that at one second, let us say like a, taking a snapshot of all positions and all speeds of all molecules in a given instant. That is what he envisioned, okay? So, it is a little bit difficult to visualize, but you can, you can imagine that. Like with a fast speed camera, you keep taking snapshots of every second what each molecule is doing, what type of motion it is, what is the speed of each molecule, of all molecules in the sample. So, this is what he was trying to envision and we call that uh, a microstate, okay? This, this entire thing, the collection of these all types of motions, all speeds of all molecule we can call that a microstate of the thermodynamic system. Now, we won't go into the details of how he developed that equation, but as it says, using the statistics uh, and um, probability theories, 
um, you can come up with each thermodynamic state has a specific number of microstate, we call it W associated with it and that gives us the entropy or entropy S is K natural log W. This is the Boltzmann equation where K is the Boltzmann constant which has the value of 1.38 into 10 to the power negative 23 joules per Kelvin. So as I said even though in his gravestone it is LOG log, it is actually natural log. So this enables us to calculate the entropy change in any sample. So for the entropy change in a process, all we need is what is the number of microstate initially and finally. Remember it is a state function, so it depends only upon initial and final states, right? So something is wrong with this one. Oh, you do not need these LNs anymore, right? Delta S is K L N W final K L N W initial. So, okay, the bucket is correct. Okay, that's good. So, maybe I should take the pen and strike it out. Yeah, there are too many L N's in there. Oh, come on. I didn't even hook up the pad today. Oh, forget about it, guys. <clears throat> anyway, the book, if it is correct, then you can remember that, right? So, another point is entropy increases with the number of microstates in the system. Okay, so that is also clear from this equation because if delta S is K ln ln W, sorry, W final versus it divided by W initial, then if W is the number of microstates, if this increases, that means your numerator is increasing, right? So this entire quantity will be a larger number if the W is increasing, right? So S is directly proportional to W or change in entropy is directly proportional to the increase in microstates in the system. Now the number of microstates, so we said entropy would increase with the number of uh, microstate increase. The other three factors which would usually affect an increase in entropy are temperature, volume and the number of independently moving molecules in a sample. Now this is, well let us just briefly look into what do we mean by this. Well temperature of course we know that, we does not, we do not have to uh, look into any examples. Temperature just like the cold water and warm water, cold water molecules have less energy so they do not move around so much, right? Um, in warm water molecules are in greater motion or in other words more randomness or ice and water, ice molecules are in a fixed position, right? They are kept rigid whereas the temperature increase, it melts, becomes water, molecules are in faster motion or more randomness. So as we increase the temperature, usually the randomness also will increase. Now the volume, you can think of that as the gases, just like we have seen in the previous examples. If gas is contained in a smaller volume and if you just increase the volume, the molecules have now more space to move around, so more randomness. If more molecules are moving around, then there is more randomness. Now the number of independently moving molecules, what do we mean by that? Okay, let's just finish this and stop, okay? Because <laughs> so, okay, here is a picture of ice molecule, not ice molecule, water molecules in ice and we know that there is hydrogen bonding in water, 
right? So that is why ice has this hexagonal structure and less density than water because of the water molecules, hydrogen bonding, you have a lot of empty space between the molecules. We know that all those things, right? Okay, so because of this hydrogen bonding, another uh, problem is the molecules are really rigid and kept fixed positions in ice. They cannot just move around because each molecule has this network of hydrogen bonding it is connected to, so it cannot move around. So or in other words, it does not have any freedom at all. Now you can imagine, as we just said, if you melt the ice to water, molecules are moving around. What if you boil the water? Now you have water vapor where the molecules can occupy whatever space it is available. Liquids still have some limitations, right? It cannot just rise itself from its container and, you know, increase randomness. But whereas vapor, it can occupy whatever space available and increase the randomness. So, we would say entropy in gases is greater than entropy in liquids, which is greater than entropy in solid. Makes sense right because entropy is randomness. Now what happens when a solid dissolve in a solvent? Entropy is increasing but can we kind of explain that? What happens when a solid dissolve in a solvent? Here is a picture we are putting some solid into some water so here is the solid and this picture you have seen this before, this is hydration or the compound ionic compound dissociating into its ions and each ion is getting solvated by the water molecules. Why the entropy is increasing? In solid, look at the picture, they are in an arrangement, right? They cannot move around, positive and negative ions, they are in the crystal lattice. Whereas when it is dissolving, now these ions are spread and they are free to move around anywhere. So in terms of this ionic compound or the solid, entropy is increasing. What happens to the water molecules? If you just look into the water molecules only in that picture. Entropy is increasing or decreasing? decreasing? It is decreasing because before if it was pure water they were just free to move around anywhere, right? But as an ionic compound dissolve, as you can see, each of these ions are now solvated or hydrated by surrounding water molecules and is this water molecules, are they free to move around now? They are not because of the ion dipole interaction. This is the intermolecular attraction, ion and dipole of the water, right? So because of this ion dipole interaction, these water molecules are not free to move around now or their movement is limited by the ions movement. So for the solid, the entropy is increasing whereas for the water entropy is decreasing but still this process happens because overall or the net entropy change is a positive quantity, right? Because still these ions from this rigid structure now they are free, they are moving around and when they move around they still move around with those water molecules. It's not that they are fixing those water molecules into a position where it cannot move at all. So overall, the entropy is increasing, but when some of the ionic sol solids with very high charges, when they dissolve, um, the entropy change can be negative because as the charge of the ion increase, the attraction between the ion and the water molecule is also going to increase, right? greater the ion's charge, stronger the attraction of the ion with the water molecules. And if you have sufficient ions, 
they can really kind of lock all those water molecules into that rigid position around them. So, when some uh, cations and anions which are of very high charge, they can actually have a net decrease in entropy. Now, uh, the entropy change, generally the entropy increases when gases are formed from liquids and solids. Of course, that makes sense because gases can move around um, compared to liquids and solids or liquids or solutions are formed from solids or the number of gas molecules are increasing or the number of moles increasing. So, anything increase means more randomness therefore, more um, entropy. But look at this picture, what do you think in uh, what is happening here in terms of entropy? Entropy is increasing or decreasing? when this reaction is happening. The entropy is decreasing because in the reactant side you have 2 moles of something uh, nitrogen oxide, monoxide and 1 mole of oxygen. So, total you have 3 moles of gas here, right? But when the reaction happening you are forming nitrogen dioxide and how many moles are you forming? 2 or in other words the number of moles is decreasing in this chemical reaction, right? So, even though this is both are gas, um, since the number of moles is decreasing here the net entropy is negative or the entropy change is uh, negative. Make sense? why this happens? Okay. Oh, you know what? We will stop right here. I do not think I have enough energy to go through the third law. So, next class we have the exam, right? Uh, focus on 16 and 17. Look into your homework problems and quizzes you have done. Um, 18, um, it is not going to be much, there might be a couple of uh, multiple choice questions, okay? So, focus on 16 and 17, um, people who did not do good on the first exam, you guys have to score perfect. Well, it is for everyone, it is good that everyone score the perfect score. but. Um, People who had bad scores in exam 1, be more active and make up in this exam, okay? All right.